everyone. Welcome to Door County Reads Festival 2022. My name is Tina Kakuski. I'm director of the Door County Library. And thank you for joining us tonight for Won't You Be My Neighbor with Coggin Herringa from Crossroads at Big Creek. Before we begin, there's a little housekeeping to do. This program may touch on varying points of view. We thank you for being open to hearing others' opinions and participating in intellectual freedom in a respectful manner. Please remain muted throughout the program today. We may mute you if we notice there is extra unneeded sound. Please use the chat feature to ask questions. We will be answering questions at the end of the program. We cannot promise that all questions will be used during this session, but we thank you for your participation. This event includes live transcription. Please click the CC or closed caption symbol in the bottom toolbar, then click show subtitle. You will not be able to have chat and closed captioning enabled at the same time. Zoom toggles back and forth between those two functions. Also, please follow us on social media with hashtag Door County Reads. And now please join me in welcoming Kagan Herringa. Thank you very much, Tina. And uh, I'm glad all of you have come and I think we're ready to start. All right, so um, I'm Kagan Herringa and I am the interpretive naturalist at Crossroads of Big Creek. And I am very excited to be a part of Dora County Reads 2022. And I'm also proud to say that I was trying to figure it out, either 12 or 13 of the years that we've had either Dora County Reads or the Big Read, Crossroads has been a partner. And it has been a real privilege to work with the library and all of the organizers of this activity. And I personally am so grateful because it gives it gives me something to look forward to in the winter. It makes winter special. So we're really grateful for Door County Reads. And today we're going to do a program called Won't You Be My Neighbor? Now, if we are at Crossroads and we originally were planning to be at Crossroads, at this point, I would give the acknowledgement statement for the First Nation people. And I would also then probably blame everything on the Ice Age glaciers because that's just what I do. But since we aren't at Crossroads right now, instead, I'm going to use the words of Michael Perry. Population 485, page 39. Glaciers were the original visitors, ebbing and flowing throughout the Pleistocene Ecuador. The ice made its last big push to 25, thousand years ago, advancing until two thirds of the land we now know as Wisconsin was blanketed. My backyard was a mile deep in ice. When the glacier finally withdrew, and it did so reluctantly, and 10,000 years ago, on the cusp of the Holocene epoch, the Chippewa lobe of the great Laurentian ice sheet made its last charge south, stopping just short of New Auburn, before retreating for good. In its wake, we were left with a raw poetic top topography of kettles and moraines, cames and eskers, and drumlins. Wildlife thrived in the post-glacial period and humans followed. A copper lance was found outside town in the late 1900s, and it suggests that Paleo-Indian hunters were in the area 6,000 years ago. At some point, Sioux Indians arrived. Later, Ojibwas filtered down from the north. By 1760, two tribes were warring after many battles, one of which took place on the shores of a local lake now studded with summer homes. The Ojibwa finally drove off the Sioux. White men appeared in the form of fur trading Frenchmen. In 1767, Jonathan Carver, a captain from New England, A captain from the New England militia came and the white incursion had begun. By the time the lumberjacks swept through the mid 1800s, the settlement area was well underway. 
fueled by the usual mincemeat of destination and deception. And except for a few stragglers, the Indians were gone, leaving behind arrowheads and wild rice beds. Today, when I see the cornfields sprouting duplexes and hearing my neighbors mourning the loss of the family farm, a decimation that began in the 1980s and now is virtually complete, my gut sympathies lie four square with the displaced farmers. But I can't help but think that this land has been lost before. So, I'm going to kind of use the Michael Perry technique and just tell you some true stories about myself to kind of explain how I am relating to the two books we have for this year's uh, read. My husband and I moved to Door County in 1988. So I am an outsider. I was not born in the Dorchester. I don't have any cousins in Door County. In fact, I don't have any cousins in the state of Wisconsin. And I could probably count on the hands, on one hand, the number of people who know my maiden name. Now we lived in a little house out on McRiver Road, maybe a 20 minute walk if we took a shortcut through the woods to what then was called the Wagon Trail Resort. And one of the first things we learned when we got here was there was a little bakery there and they had pecan rolls to die for. So we would walk over for a treat and very often a gentleman would come over to chat and his name was Leonard Peterson. Turns out he owned the place. And we weren't that special, he chatted with everybody. But once he found out that we weren't tourists, well, then he made a point to find out where we lived. And when we told him, he said, oh, you live in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. Won't you be my neighbor? And it turns out we did live in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. A man named S.A. Rogers um, lived where the wagon trail is and according to the advocate of May 20th, 1880, he bought some land and intended to build a store. And in 1881, the advocate recorded that he had recently um, returned to New York and he had laid in a big stock of merchandise, especially adapted to the wants of the people of the county. But he also started buying land and he eventually um, owned 2000 acres around Raleigh's Bay. And our little house was in that tract. And so Leonard really was our neighbor and he turned out to be a very good neighbor. Well, very soon after I got here, I, I got two jobs. They were both part-time. And so I was the naturalist at Newport State Park half-time and I was a substitute teacher at Gibraltar School District. And so at Newport State Park, I learned to know all of my neighbors from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And at Gibraltar School District, I learned to meet all of the descendants of my neighbors from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. So that was interesting. Some of those, some of those children that I sub for have grown up to be pillars of the community. It's hard to believe, just saying. Uh, when I was at Newport, uh, I wrote my first grant proposal and we got it. Uh, it was to the Wisconsin Humanities Council and it was to interpret history. And part of the money was going to be to make a trail guide, which we did, and to build a kiosk at lot 13 to tell a little bit about the history of Newport State Park. And the rest of the money was to pay me to do historical research. I mean, what a deal. They were gonna pay me to do what I was doing for fun. So I collected a lot of oral histories from people who lived in the neighborhood and some of the residents of SCAN, and a couple of days a week, days that I didn't call, get called to be a substitute, I drove all the way into Sturgeon Bay and I lived in the lorry room of the Door County Library at Sturgeon Bay. And I read books and I read the unpublished notes and the hanging files, and I read the newspapers and all the stories. And back in those days, they, they were all on microfiche. And I came in every week with a little roll of dimes. And when I wanted to save something, I put a little dime in the machine and a little photocopy of that piece of newspaper came out. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna say that now 
all of those materials, all of the books, all of the newspapers, they are all available online thanks to the library and thanks to Laura who transferred them all. And so you don't have to come in now. Anywhere you are in the country, you can just log in and read all of these things and it was wonderful. But I learned about my neighbors and I learned about them from stories. Now, before I drop my Mr. Rogers neighborhood um, metaphor, I do want to do one thing before I go on. Uh, you know, I'm too old to have watched Mr. Rogers on TV, but he was kind of part of the, just sort of the, what everybody knew about Mr. Rogers. And one of his famous sayings was, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And I guess in this day and age, even that is controversial, but look for the helpers. So here's my personal story. I was at Newport State Park and uh, I, it, it was fall and it was, it was a crummy day. In fact, it was worse than that, but I can't use polite words um, to describe how awful the day was. The wind was blowing, it was foggy, it was awful. And I had, I had a nature hike scheduled, but I doubted if anybody would come in because it was just, it was a horrible day, horrible weather. So I was in the park office waiting and some campers came in and they said that they had just found a broken up kayak on the shore of Duck Bay. A well, broken up kayak didn't sound good. And so the park superintendent called um, the police or somebody and they said, well, that's funny because um, one of the restaurants in town had uh, called and said that they had a, uh, an employee who was always really reliable and she didn't show up for work and they checked her apartment and she wasn't there and somebody knew that she was going kayaking and suddenly we had a, a missing person. And what happened? I don't know what happened, but in no time at all, parking lot three filled up with cars and trucks and pickups and emergency vehicles. And the entire community turned out and started walking up the beach. I mean, this was a weekend day and these people dropped what they were doing and they all went out because there might be someone who needed help. It turned out we did find the person um, the young woman was out on Spider Island. She had hung her slicker on one of the trees. The uh, Coast Guard helicopter had come over from Traverse City and it was listening to walkie talkies and had heard somebody say, do you see that yellow or on Spider Island? And, and they came down with a ladder and they rescued her and they brought her all in and the community was all around in parking lot. And, and I just looked at all the people who, because somebody might've needed help, dropped everything they were doing and came out on a really crummy, crummy day and walked the beach because somebody might need help. Look for the helpers. Mr. Rogers was right. My second story, also I was working at Newport State Park when one day a tornado hit, Sturg or, well, hit Door County, came in about in what Murphy Park and came roaring through that area. And I got to work at Newport and everybody was in the park vehicles and they said, get in, we're going down. There was a tornado and we have mutual aid. I had no idea what mutual aid was. And they said, well, there's, there was a, a, a campground it's called Door County Camp Resort and it's a campground and we're a campground and they need help, so we're going. And again, same thing happened. We get down there and the, um, the professional uh, EMTs and so forth were organizing us, but people from the community, mutual aid, people said, people need help. We will go and help. And I have to say, I developed a real, real respect for the helpers of Door County. And I'm supposed to be one of those Norwegian stoic people, but last week when the firemen gave their, their panel for this um, thing, and they were talking about what it meant to help people and how important it was. I have to say, thank you. I have so much respect for the people, for the helpers. And so I'm not gonna to talk too much about helpers from now on, even though that's the main topic of population 
but thank you helpers. I really appreciate you. I have called you in every job I've had. I've needed you in every job I've had and you've come and I'm grateful. So moving on. The name of my project then, or my lecture is Meeting My Neighbors, but unlike Michael Perry, who met his neighbors one siren at a time, I met my neighbors one story at a time. And I told you at Newport, we got a grant to do humanities research. And I have to point out that humanities research is just a little bit different than scientific research. In science, the uh, researcher will come up with a hypothesis and then he'll do a whole bunch of, he or she will do a whole bunch of experiments to try to prove that that hypothesis is true. In humanities, it's just a little bit different. Uh, in humanities, you ask key questions. You say, what would I like to learn? And then you do everything you can to try to find evidence to answer your key questions. That may not seem like a significant difference. And in a lot of ways it isn't because in science and in the humanities, if you get evidence that change your original idea, you alter your idea. I mean, it, it always is changing. As we get more evidence, we change our opinions, we change what we think. But in humanities, you ask the questions. And so when I decided I was gonna do this lecture and. And I, they said, oh, what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, um, okay, my key questions, are there neighborhoods in Door County and are they different from New Auburn? And my second question is, are the neighborhoods in Door County different from each other? And the third question is, does the writing of Michael Perry ring true for Door County? So I'm going to go through, um, I'm going to read some things from Michael Perry. I'm going to give some of my own reactions. I'm going to tell you things I've learned through my studies. And then at the very end, I'm going to read just some little short snippets that I took out of some of the books and try to see if they ring true for Door County. So here we go. Um, speaking of... Um, the Raleigh's Bay and the wagon trail. I had a really sweet gig when I first moved here. They used to have elder hostels. Now they call them road scholars, but they had elder hostels out at the wagon trail and the groups would stay there and they would hire me to come in and do a nature hike. And they pay me to go birding. It was really a good gig. But the other thing is they invited my husband and me to eat with the people who were in the class in the um, next meal after I had given my hike. So if I gave a, a pre-breakfast uh, pre bird hike, I'd have breakfast there and get to eat pecan rolls or Danish puffs. And if it was dinner, I got to eat from the buffet. It was wonderful. And so whenever I was there, after Leonard glad handed all the, the people who were in the elder hostel, he came over and sat with Don and me. And of course, we always got talking about our neighbors and, um, after a while, Don would look at us and say, okay, are you talking about people who are alive today? Or are you gossiping about people who lived back in history? And Leonard looked at him straight faced and said, if it happened more than a hundred years ago, it's not gossip. Okay, fine. So I made some rules for myself for this lecture. And to avoid gossip, I am only going to talk about situations that happened more than a hundred years ago. This is a history talk. Um, the next, I don't know if this is a rule or if I just wanna share this. Many of the things I say may sound like ethnic profiling. Uh, I choose to think it is cultural awareness because we had many people come to Door County from European countries and they came from different cultures, they spoke different languages, and they had different customs. And embedded in those different customs were different ways of living. And so when I say the Scandinavians did this, and the Germans did this, and the Belgians do this, okay, maybe it's ethnic profiling, but maybe I'm just aware that people from different places have different traditions and different customs. 
And so they seem different in a way, but they're all neighbors. Um, the third thing I want to point out is that this, this is not a comprehensive history of the peninsula. I will leave a lot out, probably things that you care about. Um, but really what I did is I went through the two books very carefully. I, I first I read them and I read both of them a long time ago. But I read them again, and then I went through again, and if anything struck me as familiar, kind of a literary deja vu, I put it in the talk. So I will be reading some selections from both of the books, but I will also add my own personal reaction. And as Tina pointed out in the um, introduction, they truly are my opinions. They are, they are not like gold. They're just something I think or something I've read. So luckily for me, uh, Leonard wrote a book and many of the stories he told me about Raleigh's Bay, about my neighborhood and about Newport, he put in the book. So I, I have been able to look up some of the things to kind of reassure myself that I didn't remember wrong because that was a long time ago. And so one of the questions I had about uh, Newport, when I was doing going through the files at Newport, I found some archaeological um, records from um, the Masons. Uh, Masons were archaeologists up here, and they had discovered that at Duck Bay, there had been the remains of a little shanty town, and the shanty town was called Bohemian Town. So I asked Leonard if he knew anything about Bohemian Town, and the shanty town, and well, of course, Leonard knew about it because it all goes back to Mr. Rogers. Uh, Mr. Rogers, remember he had 2000 acres and what could a man do with so much land? And I am now reading from the book, Raleigh's Bay, Reliving the Heritage of Northern Dare County by Leonard Peterson, page 52 and 53. What could one man do with all that land? Large quantities of lumber products were moved and shipped out by schooners, and that came in the dock. And he needed a large crew of hardy men to conduct his operation. And he recruited immigrants. Many of them were Bohemian. And just as an aside, Leonard Peterson told me that, that Mr. Rogers really, really liked Bohemian people. He thought they had a work ethic. He thought they were strong. He thought they were brave. He thought they were consistent. So when he went out to the docks, he would try to recruit as many Bohemian people as he could. And they had recently arrived in America and he made a deal with them. If they would work for him in the woods or in his sawmill, part of their compensation would be 40 acre tracts of lumber where the timber had been logged off. Um, that much land was of little use to Mr. Rogers. And with a lot of hard work using much dynamite to blast out the large stumps, the new owners could turn the acreage into profitable farmland. And so yes, in Mr. Rogers neighborhood, almost, not all, but almost everyone was Bohemian. And so they had these little 40 acre farms, but they still wanted to make money. So in the winter time, after they had logged off their own land, they would go over and they'd walk across Raleigh's Bay and Mink River on the ice and build little shanties at Duck Bay. And they would log parts of Newport and then they would um, put the logs out on the water and they'd float them down to the sawmill at Raleigh's Bay. And so Bohemian Town, and this is what I was told, the men came over on Monday morning and they lived in these little teeny shanties and they cut wood all week. And on Saturday, they walked back across the ice and they spent Sunday with their family. And I don't know if they bathed, but they did worship probably in their own homes. And then on Monday morning, they went back across the ice. And so that's how they provided for themselves. And so there was a really, really close connection between the Bohemian people in Raleigh's Bay and the people who were in Newport. But there were also lots of Norwegians who settled in Newport because Hans Johnson then had a, a dock there and he hired Norwegians to cut his wood and so forth. But there were other people who were in the area 
And this is also from Leonard Pe Peterson's book. He said, in an interview with Matt Mikolash, I learned many things about the area, about his and other families. Matt's father came to this country from Czechoslovakia with his parents. In 1880, when Joseph was only two years old, at that time, Czech men were forced to join their country's army to fight against the Germans, and Joseph's father didn't want to do this. The only way he could avoid um, it to, was to emigrate to this country. And so the Miklosh family settled on a farm on Highway ZZ in Wildwood. Well, I've learned later that many, many people who settled in Door County, not just from Czechoslovakia, but many of the people from the German speaking lang um, areas came to America to avoid being um, inscripted into the army. They didn't want to fight. They didn't want to fight for the whatever. So they would come to America to in, avoid becoming a part of the army. Or there was also a really, really kind of unfortunate situation in Europe. Um, there were more people than there was land. And so they had this rule that uh, the eldest son would inherit the land and the other siblings then would just have to work for their, their sibling or they would have to go into town and get another job. And so what that means is a lot of these young men had no chance of earning or of owning land at all unless they came to America. So many, many of the people who came to America came because they had no chance of owning land on their own. But if they came to America, they could have land, they could own land. And that was their big dream to own a piece of land. And so that's why they came. So um, I was reading the Charles Martin History of Door County, which was written in 1880. It's a short book. And he was talking about going out and trying to interview some of those German people in the central part of Door County. And he said uh, they would hide from him because they didn't know English. All they knew was German and they didn't take newspapers and they didn't talk to anybody. They just lived on their land. And this was 15 years after the Civil War. But when he went out, he was told that the people were hiding from them because they didn't want to fight in the Civil War. And so they thought if they would just avoid fighting in the Civil they if they would just hide, they wouldn't end up in the army. And so, um, yes. The people who moved here in the early, early days, right after the Civil War, and they homesteaded here, and it was wonderful, but truly, they were very, very isolated, and they were very afraid of becoming soldiers, so they moved here. Um, back in 1940, a uh, sociologist of some kind, went around Door County and he made a map of the dominant ethnic stock of Door County. And you can see here, um, if I can use my cursor, I can't. Um, the Belgians were in the Southern part of the county and they that went into, down to Green Bay. And then there was a whole mess of German people and the French and the Irish. And as you get farther and farther North, you get into the Scandinavian areas. And then they have uh, Washington Island listed as uh, Icelandic stock. Was that always true? Well, it turns out, and I, I'm using for my information, a book called The Communities of Door County by Marlene Allen. Um, we'll start at Washington Island. Um, like um, during the 1880s, this is from Marlene um, Allen. During the 1880s, the United States government made treaties with tribes like the Potawatomi. This gave the government large amounts of land to sell. That land that once belonged to Indians was no longer theirs. As early as 1837, these islands were surveyed and platted as a part of the Wisconsin Territory, and the first land entries on Washington Island were made in 1839 in 1840. The early settlers were fishermen. They were attracted to Washington Island because of excellent fishing grounds. 
White fish and trout were plentiful and catches were amazing. Early commercial, commercial fishing boats were much different from the ones we use today. Back then in the 1840s, they were Mackinaws, very small little sailboats with oars. The nets were used were gill nets because they caught the fish by their gills. The first settlers of Washington Island, are you ready for this? Were Yankees, meaning they came from New York or from New England, Illinois and Ohio. And then here's something that I think is especially pertinent because February is Black History Month. In 1853, there was a settlement of black fishermen living in West Harbor. Where they came from and when they arrived is a mystery. It is suggested that they were helped by the Underground Railroad that is rumored to have had a stop off station in Green Bay prior to the Civil War. The group, there was a preacher named Old Bennett and some people claim that he had been a cabin boy for Commander Perry on Lake Erie. And there is a historic picture that shows a young black boy in the boat with Commander Perry during his battle of Lake Erie. Many believe this boy was Old Bennett and he died on the island in 1854. The colony left as mysteriously as has it arrived. The census was taken in 1855 and by then they were gone. You know, there were people on Washington Island and there were bounty hunters looking for black people. The Washington Island people never betrayed them. The fact that they could have a colony there and be safe is a real tribute. They were neighbors. And I'm kind of proud of Door County and I hope we continue to be as welcoming as into the future. Everybody gives credit to uh, the uh, Icelanders. They didn't even show up till the 1870s, but um, they have much better public relations. So the Icelanders got all the publicity and that's what we all think was the beginning of Washington Island. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to, to uh, Michael Perry. And um, I'm talking about now the Northern part of, of Door County, which was pretty much settled by, by Scandinavians. Now this is, comes from um, Michael Perry's um, page 159. I come from a long line of Scandinavian Stoics. In most social settings, if not shy, we were determinedly reticent. Our guiding precept is, I don't want to talk about my feelings and you can't make me. My tears may have loosened a bit about talking about my feelings and I can grow grumpy and scowly as my mother used to say, a little snippy. But in general, I am pathologically self-contained. Writing wise, I share things on the page that would mortify me if they came up in casual conversation. But these seizures of self-disclosure are tribute are triggered by the imminence of tongue loosening deadlines and health insurance premiums. And they should not be therefore confused with me at the post office where I tend to study my boots and mumbled. Um, there, um, in the world of the certified stoic, repression of emotions is just more than half of the battle. The rest of your time is consumed with masking the appearance of the existence of desire. Anyone who can hold back a tear or anyone can hold back a tear or dodge a hug. It takes a real hardcore Norwegian bachelor to pretend you don't want a cookie. Um, if I were commissioned to design an official crest for the descendants of the emotionally muzzled Vikings everywhere, I would begin by looking up the Latin phrase by, no thanks, I'm fine. This outgrowth of neurosis turns the simplest trip to the grocery store into a pulsating gauntlet of dread. Shopping for staples seems to be benign enough, but when you present your basket at the counter, you are revealing something deeply personal about yourself. 
you are approaching a stranger and saying, in public, this is what I desire. And not only that, this is what I desire to put inside me. If you are buying a battery cable or a snow shovel at Fleet Farm, well, there's no shame in that. But with food, there are distressing elements of psychosexual at play. Appetites, hungering, give me Twinkies, coupled with the implication that if you ingest it, you surely must excrete. And this is not a place for, that a Stoic wants to uh, go. All the time I did oral histories and talked to people, I heard over and over and over and over again that Norwegians and Swedish and Finns drank, but they drank in their homes where no one could see them. The Irish and the Germans and the Belgians, they like to drink in groups. And so this brought up an interesting situation. In Sister Bay, where there were Swedish Lutherans and Swedish Baptists, they were officially dry. In Ephraim, where they had Moravians, they were officially dry. But in Bailey's Harbor and in Sturgeon Bay and in the Belgian country in Southern Door, those people liked to drink together. And so those places had taverns and they had group drinking and they were, they, uh, drinking was allowed. And it caused a real difference in the communities. Now, when Michael Perry gave his keynote speech last Saturday, he says, you know, there's been a lot of leveling over the years, even since I wrote the book about population. And there's really been a lot of leveling in, in the communities of Door County. But, I'll, and you know, long, long ago, um, Sister Bay stopped being dry. And even Ephraim's, Pure little Ephraim is now, well, they aren't sopping, but they're at least damp. So some things do change, but there was really a difference in the communities depending on where the people were from. Now, they didn't always hold to that. I was told by many people in oral histories, and I have some, I have some uh, references, that in, up in Elson Bay and up in uh, Newport, the young men would go out, they'd milk the cows, and then they would hike all the way to Bailey's Harbor because there was a dance hall in Bailey's Harbor. And they would dance the night away, and then they'd start home, and they'd get home in time to milk the cows when they got home. And so, okay, maybe even 100 years ago, some of the difference between the dry and the wet was sort of erased. Um, I did learn about the Moravians because Don and I joined the Moravian church. And those people always used to have for every summer, they would put on a play called Meet the Moravians for the tourists so that people could learn the history of Ephraim. And so from the congregation of Ephraim Moravian Church, I learned about Pastor Iverson and how he came and he was staying with his flock in, in Green Bay in the Tonk House, and they got frustrated with uh Mr. Tonk, because he was so aristocratic and sort of bossy and it reminded him of the people at home. So he moved his little band up to Ephraim. I knew about that. And I also found some neighbors when I did my oral histories at the nursing home. There was a wonderful man named John Collard and John Collard became one of my neighbors. And from him, I learned so much about the community. And then, um, I was still working at Newport when Tom Blackwood, who at the time was the uh, superintendent at Peninsula, said, could you do a history of Peninsula Park for us? We know you'd like to study. And so I went to Dorothy Halverson, and she was the wife of the former superintendent at Peninsula State Park. She was the most wonderful lady. She was truly a neighbor. And from her, I learned so much 
about the beginnings of the state parks, especially Peninsula, but all of the state parks, and she was my neighbor. Well, then I was still leading hikes up at Newport, and this um, young woman would come on my hikes quite often, and it turned out um, that she was the principal at Sunrise School at Sturgeon Bay. And after several hikes and knowing how much I liked outdoors and history and stuff, she says, were you ever a teacher? And I said, well, yes, I was a teacher in my other life. And she says, do you still have a teaching certificate? And I said, yeah, I have a teaching certificate. And she says, oh, down in Sturgeon Bay, we are starting a school forest. And it would be so neat. We have an opening at, at um, Sunrise School for a halftime teacher who would teach the gifted and talented programs. And you could teach half time. And then in your free time, you could start helping us with the school forest and it's called Crossroads. And it came to pass. And so I, I got the job in the school district of Sturgeon Bay. And I started helping out at the school forest called Crossroads. And about that time, oh, the other thing is when I was working with gifted and talented in Sturgeon Bay, Every fall, the middle school would take some of their junior high students up to a place called Old Victoria, which was a mining village in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And they would take the kids up and they do living history for three or four days. And um, one time they came back, they were so full of themselves and they were invited to give a program to the Door County Historical Society. And I was there that night. I wanted to hear what the kids said. And they talked about how life-changing it was for them to do living history, that they learned so much about themselves. They learned so much about history. It wasn't just names and dates. It was real. And they learned how the pioneers lived and how it was important. And some people in the historical society got kind of excited. And they thought, hmm, maybe we could make a place in Door County where young people could kind of have living history. And we had this school for us called Crossroads. And the president of the school, uh, of the historical society at that time was a man named Mitch Mackey. And Mitch Mackey got together with the school and through a lot of negotiations and so forth, we came to the agreement that we would start a little village right at the corner of the school forest. And we would call it the Crossroads Village. And that made sense because all over Door County, there were, every time there was a crossroads, there was a, a little village and there'd be a school and a church and a tavern if it was a wet area and maybe a cheese factory. And at every crossroads, there was a crossroads village. So that seemed appropriate. And so from Mitch Mackey and by getting involved in the Door County Historical Society, I became familiar with the people of Claybanks because Mitch Mackey came from Claybanks. And Claybanks is the area on Lake Michigan, um, the very, very south end of the uh, county. And the early settlers in Claybanks, oh, by the way, Claybanks was named because the sailors going by would know they were halfway between Algoma and Sturgeon Bay because they could see red clay banks. And that clay actually was used to by the Belgians to make bricks because after the um, Chicago fire and the Peshtigo fire, they realized that log cabins were not probably the best choice. And so all the cabins down there in that area turned into brick houses, okay, but I digress. Um, the early settlers came in 1855 and they were the Helmholtz and the Mackeys and the Warrens. And when we started building the historical village, well, one of the houses we brought was the Warren House. And so I learned a lot about our neighbors in Claybanks by working at Crossroads in building the historical village, which is now called the Heritage Village and is still run by the Door County Historical Society. Um, the first people, they were English, they were Scotch, and they were Irish, and some had trades. Uh, there was a blacksmith, there was a veterinarian, there was a cooper. And there was a man named William Horn, and he had a pier. So that became the community of Horn's Pier. And there was a town of Vignes. 
And there was a, there were all these little towns out there. And by 1870, suddenly we got a whole mess of Norwegians coming in and there were some Swedes and they came, but they liked the farms inland. And so they settled inland far away from the things. And there were a few people from Denmark and Germany, but they were all Lutherans. And so they formed the Tottenham Forest Lutheran Church. Meanwhile, we moved the little school from Vignes to Crossroads and we moved one of the homes. And from Mitch Mackey and from the book he wrote, I learned so much about the people who lived in Vignes. They became my neighbors. And so when we did historical representations, I was very eager to find out who I was. But also being involved in the Dura County Historical Society, I started learning about the, uh, the Belgian people and I learned from Barb Chisholm and Mary Herlesh. And they introduced me to the whole idea of being Belgium and the Kermis and all of the things that the Belgian people did. And so I got to know the whole length and breadth of the community and I learned them because I learned the different ethnic groups and they were all very different. And they had different customs and different traditions. And are they still independent communities? Are they still different? Not as much, not the way they used to be, but each community has somehow kept its ethnic um, what, identity. When we moved up here, we were amazed when we drove down the roads and the mailboxes were either painted with a Norwegian or a Swedish flag. So we knew the ethnic group. It, it was just amazing. Um, so we learned a whole lot by talking to the people. And uh, I mentioned one of the people I learned um, to know was John Collard. One of the books he wrote and it won a lot of awards was the Pioneer Cemeteries of Door County. And the Pioneer Cemetery is this is a given that in any fire and rescue business, sooner or later, you'll get called to handle a corpse. Unpretty and unprepossessed, the bodies allow us that death has no romance. Heeding Dylan Thomas, we generally do not go gentle into that good night. And John Collard told about all the deaths. In the early days, more than half of the deaths were caused by tuberculosis. Um, eight women died of childbirth. Um, two children died of hydrocephalus. Um, 13 deaths were registered. They never classified the ones that died in, in the accidents, but many, many people died of communicable diseases. Some people died of smallpox. Um, they thought it was night air. Uh, they thought it spread diseases. But later, many, many people came with diphtheria and then cholera. And because they knew a little bit about, um, about germs at that time, not a lot, they would isolate the people, they would roll them up, they'd bury them. And so the things that, that um, Michael Perry said about death, in a way they sort of rang true. So my last thing I was gonna do is just go through the books and find the little phrases and see if they really ring true in Door County. So here's a quote from one of Michael Perry's um, writings. The year has cycled around, it's Jamboree Day again. Does that ring true in Door County? Oh my, yes. Every community, every community has a festival. And as the year cycles around, we go through a whole bunch of festivals. And many of those festivals have ethnic beginnings. Um, they roof the goats in Sister Bay. They burn the Vinter Vich in Ephraim on Fearball. Bailey's Harbor has been having a 4th of July since a uh, parade since the 1860s. And Belgium, of course, in the Belgian area, they have a Kermis. And I don't know why Egg Harbor has a pumpkin fest, but they do. So having a, a yearly festival, that really rang true with me. The second one, the place was a rock patch and where the rock stopped, the swamp began. It was a tough place to subsist 
let alone thrive. Door County, Door County was a rock patch. Um, that one really rings true. You, you read about pioneers going out and picking rocks, pulling them on stone boats. There are rock piles all over the county and they represent amazing, amazing subsistence living. But the people did it and they thrived. Here's one, um, population. Uh, Michael Perry wrote about being invited to be in a parade and he was embarrassed to be in a parade because he was a writer. And he was afraid that the local people would laugh at him. In Door County, this is one that didn't ring true with me at all. In Door County, we celebrate Door County writers. I'm sure that we do because I saw a poster that said, celebrate Door County writers. So that one truly didn't ring through, true for me. People are not embarrassed in Door County to be a writer. Uh, from noon till three on Sunday, Packer fans are of one accord. Does this one ring true for me? Yes. This one was interesting. I love, love is not too strong. I love the idea of neighbors coming together to put out fires. And I am thrilled to be part of that effort whenever I am called. It feels good. It feels right. Sometimes you find a little of yourself looking for little commonalities. Go Packers. This is, this is what I, I feel. I understand that there was an emergency last night and they looked for the helpers and the helpers came. Thank you, Bug. Here on page 42, uh, 124, excuse me. Exclude the issues of culinary excellence. There is no question that I am more comfortable attending a smelt feed at the Legion Hall than I am from choosing from six forks on the five-star mezzanine. I love cycling through the line with my neighbors. And I have to say, when we're thinking of all the things that I miss since the pandemic, I have to say potlucks. I miss potlucks. I so, this so resonated with me. I love sharing a meal with my neighbors. And here's my last one. Michael Perry wrote, 12 years I lived away from here and what I missed, what I craved, was the lay of the land, a familiar corner, a particular hill, certain patches of trees, somewhere along the line, my soul imprinted on the topography. Finding your place about the people, now that is a different proposition. A community is a conglomeration of characters. You can't force your way in. Your place in the cast evolves over time. And that truly rang true with me. So now it's time for comments. Does the ethnic heritage of Door County communities make a difference? And do Michael Perry's reflections ring true for Door County? And I'm hoping now that I can close my screen and open up and we can have a little conversation until my time is up. Okay, I'm here and Tina's here. And uh, Tina, did you get any questions that came over the chat? We do not have any in the chat, um, but um, perhaps some of our attendees tonight would have some comments or questions so they can feel free to unmute themselves um, and ask questions. So everyone in Zoom should be able to unmute yourself and turn on your camera now, if you wish. I want to see who's here. Oh, hi. Nice to see you. You know, it's really hard to talk to a computer screen and not have the reactions of an audience. It's very mm -hmm. disconcerting, actually. So does anybody have a reaction about, um, did Michael Perry's words ring true to you? Was New Auburn the same as Door County? And does the ethnic heritage of our communities make a difference?
I know on Facebook, you have received a number of likes on oh, thank uh, you. your video. <laughs> so people are watching. People are watching. Thank you. No questions, no comments. Oh, it says, oh, the host is not allowing to unmute. Oh, um, I will be the problem. Yep. I will ask um, Laura to unmute. And then I'll also ask Laura to start her camera if she wishes. <laughs> My hair is not looking very good right now. <laughs> Do I have to? <laughs> no, you don't have to. You can just no, ask but... your question. I, I can thank you, thank you, thank you for all the work you've done in the Lori room to make things available because it sure makes humanitarian, uh, humani humanities research 100,000% easier. Oh, question about um, it, It's fun working there. I, I love hearing your talk and all the things you've studied through the years. Thank you. And I totally identify with it. <laughs> I too love it. Um, so Coggin with the Crossroads program with the gifted students at Sturgeon Bay, how did that turn into Crossroads at Big Creek? Well, um, what happened is the Historical Society formed the uh, Heritage Village and it's right there on the corner, right by the uh, roundabout. And then Crossroads at Big Creek does the environmental studies and they have the Collins Learning Center and the Astronomy Center. and. We work collaboratively. We are two separate organizations. We work independently, but we work together. We're partners. We're neighbors. Well, I know I love uh, Crossroads at Big Creek. I live nearby and hike the trails um, from time to time and bring my kiddos there. And it is a treasure. And I love that it's open year round and I love that it's free. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Thank you. You can be our neighbor. <laughs> I am your neighbor, kind of. <laughs> Pretty close. Can you tell us something about the Cove um, ar archaeology project that's going on down there. Uh, well, we have um, on the Crossroads property, we now have three different archaeological sites, and they're now state registered. So we have one site at our Ida Bay Preserve, one at the Hanson Homestead, which is on U Utah Street, and one at the Cove Preserve. And last year we got working at the Cove Preserve and one of, um, again, with a, a humanities grant from the Wisconsin Humanities Council. I love those people. They've helped me a lot. And uh, we were able to bring up a professor from, um, he was just retiring from UW Milwaukee and he was the head of their archeology span program. And he kind of fell in love with the program and said, you know, we really need to start testing this because you've reached a, a an area right now where um, there was a huge change in the diet of people and, and their culture changed and their spirituality probably changed, their trade changed because of change in diet. And so we got another grant and we are now taking the artifacts that we have unearthed and having them tested. And we just recently got back uh, carbon dating from our first set of tests. And we found out that people have lived at the cove 300 years ago, but other people lived as long ago as 1100 years ago. So we have, it wasn't just one settlement, it was generation after generation after generation. And so we've had a whole series of people who have been living by the cove. Now he was up last week and went through some, um, some of the artifacts and we're sending them off to all sorts of different labs to be tested for blood and they can, they can get a little blood residue off the pure spear points and the um, projectile points, and they could tell what animal or human the blood came from down to genus. So we're, we're testing for deer, elk, beaver, um, and human to see what the blood was from. They can take the pottery and tell where it was made by doing a thin section and looking at it. We have a specialist who can look at seeds and uh, we, we um, what, sift out the seeds in a float machine and they can tell what seeds and we can find the bones of animals. And this man is a specialist. And by looking at those, we can tell what they were eating, what foods they were eating, what foods they were growing. We can tell from the residue on the inside of our ceramics um, what was stored in the pots. 
So we're learning all sorts of things, combining the humanities and really high powered scientific methods and techniques and analysis. And we're learning about all of our things and we will be continuing our studies. And this spring, we're hoping to um, focus on our um, dig at Ida Bay and hopefully next fall, yeah, next fall, we will have a historical map of the Ida Bay Preserve telling where the um, First Nation people had their homes, where the orchards were, where there was a resort, where the lumberjacks were, where the orchards were. Our 60 acre preserve has um, kind of, a, it's kind of a microcosm of Door County history. We've had everything from quarries to the, there was a, a boarding house. We think that the men that dug the ship canal lived in that boarding house. We have everything on this little teeny preserve. And so we are going to have a annotated history map, I hope, if I get it done. And that will come out next fall. I'm really looking that forward wonderful. to that. wonderful. Yeah. We've walked down there many times already. Um, it's a very interesting area. Kyle, we do have a question that came in. Um, uh, do you have any recommended reading on the Black community on Washington Island? Very little. Um, it's mentioned in Paul, Bert, Paul and Fran Burton's um, Stories of the Islands. It's um, mentioned in um, of the Martin history, but it was pretty low key. Um, everybody kept a, kind of under, under wraps because otherwise they would have been found. And the best they know is that they disappeared into Canada, but nobody's sure. It's, it's a mystery. But they were safe while they were on the island. And I just think that is kind of a happy part of, of Black history. There aren't, there aren't many of them, but that's one we can celebrate. There is that um, novel fiction based on that story. Um, I can't think of the title. I am not aware of that. So. Go to Laura, she knows. <laughs> I see a lot of likes happening on Facebook. So people okay, have enjoyed it looks your like, stuff. It looks like the hour is up. So probably we, we should probably close. Um, thank thanks. you so much, Kagan, for all thank of your- Thank you. And thank all of you who have become my neighbors through this talk. And we'll see you at Crossroads. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone and be sure to join us for upcoming Door County Reads events. There'll be a supporting Wisconsin Writers Panel on February 10, a play reading of Population 485 by Rogue Theater on February 11, a panel discussion titled Things Like Hope and Faith and the Griffin String Quartet Program both on February 12, and a final book discussion on February 14. And go to doorcountyreads.org calendar for links and codes to access all the events and leave us some feedback by filling out the online form. And thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.